In mid-July of 1991, when Sam was six years old, he was holding his mother's hand as they walked barefoot across the baking hot asphalt of the neighborhood Paul's parking lot. He had his other arm through the hole of his inflatable black inner tube and was gazing off at an angle tangential to the sun. Something was bothering him and had been ever since school let out the month prior. Sam refrained from telling his mother about it, and his father was not exactly the prime source of emotional comfort because he was afraid that she would think that he was going crazy. The passage of time for the young always seems so much slower than for an adult, even in the happiest of days. With the secret weighing on Sam's heart, the past month felt like an eternity. Finally, he screwed up the courage to speak. Ma, I've got to tell you something. She looked down at him, a kind but apprehensive smile spreading across her face. She knew he was a good boy, but that was rarely a good way for your child to start the conversation. Go ahead, sweetie. Sometimes I see things, like some kind of squirmy bugs, Sam said. I don't think they're really there. I can kind of see them and they run away when I look straight at them. But they're always there. I think they might be inside my eyes. Her smile widened as she looked off to the side, so as to not let him see it, since this seemed to be a serious issue for Sam. So many nonsensical worries turn into serious issues for Sam, a trait he most likely inherited from her. Most of Sam's issues tended towards the monster in my closet category, a battle she had finally won through countless subsequent nights in which he was not eaten by a guru, so she thought something with an actual medical explanation should be easily put right. I used to get those sometimes, lots of people do actually. I know they look weird, like squirmy little worms or something, but they're really just harmless little specks in your eyes that people call floaters. They're not alive, and they can't hurt you. They come and go, it's no big deal. She ruffled Sam's hair as they approached the girl guarding the entrance to the pool and waved their membership cards for entrance. Sam spent the day doing backflips underwater and sometimes just bobbing along the surface of the pool in his black rubber inner tube. He slowly began to put the visions, what his mother had called floaters, out of his mind. She'd seen them too, which alone would have taken most of their menace away from him, even if they weren't harmless like she promised they were. He sometimes wondered if his parents understood how much less scary those closet monsters would have been for him if he had only acknowledged the monster's existence. Knowing you're alone with horrors that only you can see is always the worst part. But if mom sees the worms and still says everything's fine, then it must be, he thought. It was odd that she mentioned the worms, but not the spiders, or the way they scream when you try to fall asleep. But he supposed it went without saying. Sam stretched out across the tube and let himself float. Ten months later when Sam was seven, his parents took him to an optometrist, Dr. Howard, for an eye exam. After reading off a series of letters, one line had the sequence FRT, and his father's presence forced Sam to resist the urge to say fart. The doctor asked him to read another, smaller series of letters. This and other tests went on for what struck his parents as unusually long duration before Dr. Howard finally stopped and stared at Sam thoughtfully. He leaned down to get to eye level with the child as adults tend to do and said loud enough to make sure Sam's parents heard as well. Do you know what 2020 vision means? Sam shook his head in negation. It means, Dr. Howard continued, that you see things from 20 feet away as well as most people see them from 20 feet away. That's normal. Some people see things worse than most people, and they might see things from 20 feet away, as well as most people see them 30 or 40 feet away. We call them 2040 vision. But that's when people start having real problems when their eyesight. Sam's mother and father both visibly stiffened, afraid of where this might be going. Dr. Howard glanced briefly their way, held up a hand and returned his attention to Sam. Yours, on the other hand, well, it's the exact opposite. 
You have what I believe to be 26 vision. It might be even better than that, but I... He shook his head slightly, bugged out his eyes and turned up his palms. That would basically be describing an eagle. You might as well have been walking around with a pair of binoculars in your head. It's essentially unheard of. Sam's parents exhaled and smiled slightly, happy that the news was good and that their son was normal. Exceptional, even. Sam, on the other hand, felt a spine-tingling ripple of unease wash over him at the comparison to eagles that Dr. Howard had made. His parents limited his television time, except when it came to educational programs. So if it was raining outside or he was bored, his options were either a book or some informative show. Some weeks before the optometrist's appointment, he had seen a program on birds. He'd learned that contrary to what people once thought, birds caught worms not because of hearing or feeling their vibrations, but because of their exceptional vision. They would tilt their heads so that their eyes were facing the ground and watch for the most infinitesimal disturbances caused by worms passing. This tingle of unease was brought to Sam courtesy of the fact that the worms and spiders had become more well defined in the past six or seven months before the appointment and screamed louder than ever. Worst of all was hearing the doctor tell him that his eyesight was above and beyond normal. His vision had become milky and clouded with the apparitions causing him much concern. By the time the optometrist's appointment came, he could barely read even the largest letters of the eye exam, making Dr. Howard's proclamation of exceptional vision even more disturbing to him. Acting on a hunch, Sam had merely been repeating the letters which were being screened to him inside his own eyes. By the age of 11, the world through Sam's eyes had become a grayish white fog. He'd summoned up the courage to initiate a tearful and terrified conversation with his mother and father. He told them everything, and his dad responded by silently retrieving a flashlight and shining it in Sam's eyes. He mumbled something about cataracts but shook his head. He hadn't seen anything other than Sam's bright blue irises. Appointments to Dr. Howard became a bi-monthly event. Then had finally ceased. They were replaced by trips to a specialist. It was a two hour drive away, if traffic was moderate. There were four of these trips before they promptly ended and replaced by a much shorter drive to the office of a completely different manner of doctor. His office had a couch and lots of stuffed animals. All this doctor seemed interested in was talking about Sam's life and feelings. He took lots of notes. There were dots now. Little milky punctuation marks, which the worms and spiders left in their wake. While the worms and spiders kept squirming around, albeit slightly more sluggishly than they had before, the dots remained perfectly still. This essentially marked the end of Sam's ability to view the outside world. Everything now revolved around the screaming circus conducting its daily performance inside his skull. There was, however, a change in the condition which Sam regarded as horrible and merciful at the same time. They had begun to laugh. It was a terrible mixture of tittering and squealing, but it was undeniable laughter. At least they stopped screaming long enough to laugh, even if the shrill hissing sound did invariably cause his bladder to release. Eggs. They were laying eggs. At this realization, whatever tattered remnants of his sanity had been hanging on by a thread simply slipped loose and flew away. Sam was 12 years old when the white specks which had erased the last vestiges of his view of the normal world began to split open and writhe. Essentially blind and lost in a world of screaming horrors, he squeezed his fingers against the palms but kept his thumbs stuck out, curled upward like dull fishing hooks. Sam raised them to his eyes and began to dig. As his thumbs met his retinas, there was a single, distant screech, a polite but stern protest. This did not last long, once he began digging in earnest. The screaming became unfathomably louder than it had ever been before, which he allowed himself a moment to be surprised by. It was as if the creatures had discovered a bullhorn stashed away inside his skull somewhere. He realized that the noise which had been coming from the outside of his own head would have been deafening. Deafness would have been a mercy as it would have meant the cessation of the hideous, wailing cacophony being orchestrated for its audience of one. 
He dug until the milky grey view of the world turned to fire, then ultimately blackness, as the warmth rolled down his cheeks and ending in a quiet, sickening slosh on the wooden floorboards of his parents' kitchen, Sam fell to his knees. Horror and agony yielded to a relief, the likes of which most mercifully will never know, filled Sam at that moment. Blindness became a blessing, freedom from that which had so horribly oppressed him. There on his knees, Sam tittered and ran his fingers along the now vacant eye sockets. His laughter devolved steadily into screams as he began to feel a squirming sensation work its way up from the floor, ascending his form with frightening alacrity. Even without eyes, he could see the error of his ways. The same documentary which taught Sam about how birds hunt for worms went on to discuss the common goldfish and how they would grow to match the volume of their bowls. Upon achieving freedom from globes far too small for their goals, the floaters screamed in triumph through mouthfuls of their former hosts' bloody flesh.